So leaders are attending the climate summit in Egypt, but there is also a reminder by Polish President Andrzej Duda that the consequences of Russia's aggression put at risk the implementation of climate transition. Addressing leaders at COP27, he said the energy crisis and huge costs of living are hampering the timely attainment of the intended goal. The consequence of Russia's aggression are crises and huge costs which put at risk timely implementation of climate transition as well as timely attainment of the intended goals. It has also generated additional emissions exceeding the level of those produced by a number of developing countries within the scope of one year. We must strive to ensure that the Russian aggression is promptly and permanently repealed by increasing support for Ukraine, enhancing pressure on Russia, and stepping up our efforts to become independent of Russian fossil fuels. Let us not be climate hypocrites, since it's easy for the leaders of the rich north to, bo to bust with their achievements. The world, however, has the right to ask where we have moved our production. For if we have moved, moved it into non-European countries, then we should not forget that our responsibility has not disappeared. Moving on to developments out of the Russia-Ukraine invasion, India's foreign minister says his country will continue buying Russian oil as it works to the country's advantage. He made the comments after meeting his Russian counterpart. India has faced backlash for continuing to purchase Russian oil as Western leaders urge countries to stop buying it as a punishment for the invasion of Ukraine. Well, Turkey's Minister Fatih Donmez says uh, Turkey will continue uh, purchasing uh, natural gas from Russia and that uh, the purchases recently made uh, have been paid partially in rubles. He was making the comments in an interview. He said the share of local currency payments in energy trade with Russia would increase in the coming months. Now in Ukraine, residents of Hulaipol, east of the country, are now preparing for the upcoming winter. Conditions are tough and there have also been no electricity. Neighbors are huddled side by side at night to keep warm. It's been hard, however, for 60-year-old Natalia, who sleeps in a dark and dingy basement with several of her neighbors. She says fresh water is provided by the fire brigade or it's drawn from a local well. Hulaipo is part of the Zaporizhia region, which Russian President Vladimir Putin said he had annexed at the end of September. But Hulaipo has at no point been occupied by Russian forces, although many buildings have been destroyed and many civilians have fled. Those who remain regularly take cover as the crump of shelling echoes through the town. Conditions are, however, better for residents of Kherson. The Kremlin-installed authorities in the Ukrainian southern region say power has been fully restored to the central city after blaming Kyiv for attacks that disrupted water and electricity supplies. Kiro Stemyosov says a mass evacuation of residents of the right bank part of the region has also been completed. Kherson residents can privately evacuate freely, and evacuation is not compulsory. Kherson city was the first area to be captured by Russia after Moscow announced its special military operation in February. It suffered outages after Sunday's attacks in which Moscow and Kyiv have exchanged blame. Sweden's new Prime Minister, Ulf Kristersson, has vowed a firmer stance on fighting crime and terrorism. He's on a visit to Turkey, where he's seeking the approval of President Tayyip Erdogan for his country's bid to join NATO. Sweden and Finland applied to join NATO in May in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but Turkey raised objections, citing security concerns related to the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party and other groups, and over the Nordic state's ban on arms exports. The three countries signed a memorandum in June that lifted Turkey's veto while requiring Sweden and Finland to address its remaining concerns. Sweden.
Sweden wants to join NATO to enhance our own security, but Sweden also wants to be a security provider for others, and that we real, fully realize that Turkey has very legitimate demands on every new uh, NATO member, new NATO ally, to be a true uh, security provider also for the other allies, including Turkey, of course. There is a very, very firm uh, commitment in the Swedish parliament uh, for the Swedish NATO application and the trilateral member, memorandum of understanding. Um, we have taken concrete measures in terms of arms export, uh, uh, even very recently, even new decisions have been made, and I see a very good future uh, in that area. I would also say that we continue to strengthen our terrorist legislation very firmly with concrete steps the coming months. Uh, and I also would like to continue all the cooperation between the Swedish security police and the, and the Turkish uh, um, counterparts here in, here in Ankara. And if I may mention a few areas where I think the new government will have an even firmer approach, um, which is of relevance to the NATO application from Sweden. I would say this government, one of these government's main priorities is fighting crime, fighting organized crime, fighting the connection between organized crime and terrorism. The G20 summit is coming up next week and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says he will be participating in the meetings even though he will be doing so virtually. President Zelensky had previously said he would not be accepting or participating if the Russian president would also be attending the November 15th summit in Indonesia. Now, incidentally, President Vladimir Putin will be joining the G20 summit. According to President Joko Widodo, the Indonesian president, who was making the confirmation after a phone conversation with President Putin, he said he had this last week, and they had not ruled out attending the summit in Bali and would join if possible. The Financial Times newspaper quotes of the president saying that his conversation with Putin had left him with a strong impression he would not attend. As a G20 host, Indonesia has resisted pressure from Western countries in Ukraine to drop the invitation for Putin to attend a summit and expel Russia from the group, saying it does not have the authority to do so without consensus among members. And in Russia, the central bank says it sees no immediate need to further soften capital controls that have been supporting the ruble since the spring. The bank's governor, Elvira Nabulina, was making the comment to lawmakers today. A ruble has become the world's best performing currency this year, boosted by capital controls that include curbs on foreign currency withdrawals. Nabulina warned against underestimating the impact of sanctions imposed against Russia over its actions in Ukraine, but said Russia's economy and banking sector have stood up well to the challenge. As the West shuns Russia and Moscow seeks to develop other trading routes, potential partners are afraid of secondary sanctions. Sanctions particularly targeted Russia's banking sector, which posted heavy losses in the first six months of the year, and officials have pushed lenders to drastically reduce their exposure to the US dollar and the euro.